Gina, yes, are you ready? All ready? Okay. So um, hello to everyone and a big good morning, good afternoon and good evening to our participants from around the world joining us today for this exciting new launch of our webinar series planned to run through December called People Power COVID-19 and Beyond. This series centers and amplifies the voices of grassroots activists, journalists and scholars and the important knowledge and experience that they bring to the table on the nuts and bolts of how to wage constructive and successful nonviolent movements for change. We'll cover organizers from political, economic, social justice, and cultural movements seeking equality, dignity, and peace in wide-ranging struggles such as racial and ethnic justice, women's rights and empowerment, environmental justice and climate crisis, anti-corruption and good governance, self-determination struggles and land rights and indigenous rights, among others. We'll discuss important aspects of movements, including strategies, tactics, and analysis that communities use to organize and mobilize people. We'll discuss grassroots resource mobilization, communication strategies, creative methods of resistance, constructive engagements, how to train and prepare members, and how to deal with repression and violence from opponents. And we'll do this in an engaging and interactive way with your help, with extensive time for questions, comments, and discussion to allow for peer exchange and learning. And don't worry, we're not gonna do all of this today. Um, this will be over the period of the series. Uh, this webinar series, People Power, COVID-19 and Beyond is co-convened by Waging Nonviolence and Solidarity 2020 and Beyond. I'm one of the three co-founders of this new initiative, Solidarity 2020 and Beyond, and I wanted to just say a few words about our work before I turn it over to Eric Stoner, who's the co-founder and director of Waging Nonviolence. We're a network and growing coalition of organizations, activists, scholars, journalists, and psychosocial practitioners who believe in the power of ordinary people to organize and mobilize to change injustices in their local communities and by extension, the world. We believe that we are stronger connected together. Solidarity 20 and 20 and Beyond has an advisory committee with high profile experts from around the world, but is driven by 125 plus grassroots activists working in 100 countries that we call the Global Grassroots Activist Network, or GJAN. We convene bi-weekly presentations and discussions among the activists, are building working groups on participatory research, media and communications, self-care and training and capacity building for movements. Our website will be up and running later this week, and we invite you to check us out and join us at www.solidarity2020andbeyond.org. I lastly want to thank our great Solidarity 2020 and Beyond team who have done amazing work over the last several months to get us up and running. Um, my fellow co-founders and Rotary Peace Fellows, Marita Rainbird from Finland and Vedran Obachina from Croatia and our assistants, Gina Standard from the US who is the um, technical person on the webinars, Francesca Falasca from Italy, and Paul Magu from Kenya. Uh, and so now I wanna turn it over to Eric. He'll say a little bit more about waging nonviolence, go over some of the guidelines for us to have a really successful webinar today, and then we'll get started with our great panel. Go ahead, Eric. Hi, everyone. Uh, so happy to be here with you today. Uh, my name is Eric Stoner. As Catherine said, I'm, I'm one of the editors and co-founders of Waging Nonviolence, uh, which is an online publication that covers social movements and activism around the world. Um, I'm really excited personally to be a part of this series uh, because at Waging Nonviolence, we really exist to kind of explore the kinds of topics and questions that we'll be discussing today and over the next few months together, uh, particularly how people can build power and most effectively kind of affect change, social change. Um, so I wanted to just start by um, going over the structure for today's webinar panel and give some guidelines uh, and procedures. 
So we are going to be streaming live on Zoom and Facebook Live, and we'll be monitoring comments and questions uh, from both platforms, which can be asked then at the end of the, the event. Um, the event is going to be recorded, and uh, by participating, you are agreeing to the webinar being reposted on um, YouTube channels for Waging Nonviolence and Solidarity 2020 and Beyond uh, for people to view after the fact. Um, the panel is uh, scheduled to go for 90 minutes and will include uh, brief presentations and overviews by the panelists and then a dis discussion uh, among the group. Um, the last 30 minutes will be open for discussion, comments, and questions from, from the participants. If you have questions, uh, please text them in the Q&A section. And when called upon by the moderator, you have the option of unmuting and asking your question yourself or, um, or we can read it for you. We've left uh, the personal and group chat options open so that you can comment and share with others on the call. Um, we, also, we, we know that, that, we, that people have different perspectives and positions and welcome those, but we ask you to communicate uh, these respectfully or we will have to delete comments and or remove you from the event. So please don't uh, dis disrupt the event. Um, you'll receive a link uh, to share the recording of this program after it's complete and you can sign up now in the link in the chat box for our exciting webinar next week. Um, it will be focusing on how corruption is hampering the response to COVID-19 and will feature four creative anti-corruption activists from the front lines. It should be a good one, so we hope you'll join us for that as well. Um, thank you, and I'll pass it on to my good friend and colleague, Lucas Johnson, who is our moderator and a panelist member to begin. Um, Lucas uh, works with the On Being Project, which he can tell you more about and was previously the coordinator for the International Fellowship of Reconciliation. Um, thanks so much, Lucas, for uh, joining us. Uh, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, thank you, everyone uh, who's, who's here uh, and who's taken the time to be here for this conversation. Um, I, um, I, I, it's, a, it's always an honor for me to um, be in conversation with uh, people who are, are struggling for, for freedom and justice and, and peace in the world. And, uh, and I want to begin by um, acknowledging that uh, uh, Rania, um, Mook, and, and uh, Robson, that you are you're coming and taking time to, to reflect and to share in the midst of, of your struggles, in the midst of, of um, a lot of difficulty and pain and repression. And um, I don't take that for granted. And so I, I want to express my, my sincere and deep gratitude to you um, for, for sharing what you're learning and for um, giving this time uh, to, to all of us. Um, I, uh, as Eric said, I, uh, I am the executive director of the Civil Conversations and Social Healing Team at the On Being Project. Um, people may know On Being uh, through the uh, public radio program in the United States, On Being with Krista Tippett, uh, or they may know um, uh, us with, through one of our podcasts, um, and you know, uh, on being so focuses on, um, uh, you know, a lot of our content centers are on three sort of big questions, um, animating questions: What does it mean to be human? How should we live? And who should we be to each other? And this conversation that we're having today is all about who we should be to each other, and so uh, I'm honored to be able to. Uh, participate in it. Um, in uh, other capacities, I, uh, as as Eric mentioned, I was the global coordinator for the Fellowship of Reconciliation, and uh, and coming from the United States, uh, uh, I have deep roots in the Black-led freedom struggle in that country, and um, and the 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 movement for Black Lives as a current manifestation of that 
uh, centuries old struggle. So um, I look forward to being in conversation. I, I want to begin um, by uh, asking our panelists to um, introduce themselves and, and the context from which they come and, and to tell the story of their, of their movements and, and, and what they're engaging in. Uh, to kind of set the stage for the, the, the fuller conversation that we'll have in the, in the rest of our time. And so um, I'd actually like to begin with uh, Pim Siri, who you've given me permission to call you MOOC, but I know that the, the rest of, the, the, of our community here doesn't know that. So I wanna, uh, uh, I wanna just uh, acknowledge that. So uh, thank you. Why don't you start us? Yeah, good evening from Thailand. It's like uh, almost uh, 20 past 10 p.m. here already. So yeah, I'll try to keep myself awake as well as everyone who is on webinar right now. So let's start with uh, the context in my country. Okay, let let introduce let's introduce myself first. So my name is Pim Siri Petnam Rob. That's the full name and the Thai name is always I mean Thai names are always tricky. So as I told Lucas that yeah you can you can call me Mook is my nickname and it's way easier. So I'm now working with uh one of the international human rights organization, but it's not relevant in this context. So we leave it that way, but the organization is working specifically for freedom of expression and the right to protest. And I've been participating in different kind of uh, non violent struggles. The 2010, so it's been 10 years of ups and downs, tears and joys and everything. So let's just go to the context of uh, our struggle because, well, I'm not sure if everyone is that familiar. Uh, Thailand uh, was the absolute monarchy before the 1932, basically. And in the 1932, a group of uh, revolutionary just turned the country into the constitutional monarchy. But after that, there was, uh, there was of course, uh, back and forth, pushbacks and backlashes and everything. So from 1932 up until today, which is like 88 years already, we already experienced 13 coups. So basically, uh, we would have, uh, averagely, we would have to experience the coup every decade. Uh, I'm 35 years old this year and I've seen the coups by myself three times already. So averagely, every decade, the coup will take place in this country. So it's actually the back and forth and push back between, uh, let's say, the democratic force and the old elite, which is comprised of uh, which is comprised of monarchy and military. And after the last coup in 2014, the military drafted the constitution uh, that allows 250 senators to also vote for the prime minister position, which is very problematic because that means uh, whoever the person, I mean, whoever that person supported by the Senate is automatically prime minister. Uh, so after the coup in 2014, they drafted the constitution in 2016, and then uh, it went for a referendum. But during the referendum, people who uh, campaign against would know for this uh, military back constitution were criminalized and all that stuff while, pe while people who, uh, who campaign for, yes, I mean, they, they were free to do so. So this is already problematic uh, just to make it short and just to uh, summarize the situation. So after the coup, uh, yeah, after the coup in 2014, we had uh, a general election in 2019, uh, basically last year in March. And the opposition actually won more seats in the parliament, but 
of course, the disease effect is the Senate. So 250 senators, all of them voted for the former military junta who led the coup in 2014. He formed the political party and then he went for election. He lost in terms of uh, seat, number of seats in the parliament, but 250 senators went for him. So of course he, let's say, he wasn't elected by people's vote, but because of uh, our constitution is designed specifically for military junta to continue uh, their power, to continue ruling this country. So basically they came back to power and we've been living with him for six years now, since 2014. Uh, right after 2014 coup, uh, people were kind of uh, polarized, let's put it this way. Some said, uh, let's just give them a chance. So maybe the military junta would bring back the society to the, uh, bring the harmony back to the society again. And some would say, nah, that's not going to happen because uh, military junta came into power and they just had a uh, few objectives in their mind, which is of course not human rights and democracy. So people were kind of polarized. After 2014 coup, a uh, few students came out on the street a uh, few people supported them, but it wasn't that huge, the number, let's put it this way. So uh, those students faced charges, uh, people faced criminal, uh, criminal charges for protesting the coup, as well as uh, the law prohibiting uh, Thai people to, let's say, criticize the monarchy and the punishment for this law is actually very harsh. Uh, it's called less majesty. So the punishment is from three to 15 years for each cow, basically. So it's actually quite, uh, yeah, I mean, it's wrong punishment. So uh, many, many people, let's say hundreds people, face uh, criminal charges for protest. the society was kind of polarized and there was no consensus back then. But after six years and another term of uh, this junta's ruling, and because of uh, economic downfall during the COVID-19 situation, so of course, uh, this satisfaction has grown among Thai people. And even in February, right before the pandemic, uh, students started to protest in the campus because, yeah, I mean, in, in, the, in the campuses, because uh, in the universities, the law, I mean, the law we call Public Assembly Act is not applicable. So they started in the university. And then because uh, pandemics, I mean, happened all over the world, so the street protests to, to, to a certain extent were subsided. But Right after the uh, after yeah. the pandemic has uh, gotten better, the situation yeah. like right now in Thailand, we don't have a uh, local transmission for almost one hundred and twenty days already. So it's almost four months that we don't have local transmission. And mm -hmm. in June, uh, after the disappearance of uh, Thai activists in Cambodia, exile in Cambodia. His name is Wan Shalom Sat Saksit. So he was, uh, he was protesting or he was campaigning against the junta and then he left Thailand. And after that stayed in Cambodia, stayed in Cambodia since then. So he was abducted in front of uh, his residence in Phnom Penh. There was a CCTV uh, camera footage and everything. But of course, nobody has held responsible so far. This even particularly sparked the anger among young people, as well as uh, among general public, plus the economic downfall uh, during the pandemic. So now the society has come to 
kind of consensus that uh, I wouldn't claim like the 100% of population, of course, I mean, it's politics. People hold their opinion, but uh, I would say majority has come to, has come to, uh, has come to the conclusion that uh, this military, uh, former military junta wouldn't do anything good for, for any of us, of course, like the disappearances took place, uh, the economic is going downhill and all that stuff. So the protest broke out in Bangkok on 5th June, uh, yeah, this year, right after the day that the activist was abducted in Phnom Penh. And yeah, when it started, nobody expected that it would become this huge. I mean, it was, uh, I mean, of course, I mean, the protest on 18 July, uh, organized by the organization or a group called themselves Free Youth, uh, gathered about 200, no, no, sorry, 2,500 people to 3,000 people, which is uh, the biggest we've been uh, experienced so far, I mean, after the coup. And yeah, and for the protest on, another big protest organized by Free Youth on the 16th August, we experienced about, 30, uh, yeah, 30,000 to 40,000 protesters, something we didn't expect at all when the protest broke out on, first broke out on the 5th June this year. So it seems like the discontent, the anger, uh, have been kind of uh, common feelings, um, especially among young people, because they like, like they will be affected the most if they graduate, for example. Uh, yeah, they wouldn't have a job in this kind of situation. They don't want to grow up in the country where democracy and human rights are rotten, are uh, destroyed by, let's say, uh, the older generation, like the military junta and some senators sitting in the upper house. So, it's been ongoing for three months already at this point. And from the statistic, uh, Thai lawyers and human rights, uh, Thai lawyers for human rights has been collecting until up until 21st July, there were at least 75 protests happening in 44 provinces. Uh, something we didn't expect either when, yeah, when the first protest started in Bangkok is ongoing and the next protest is uh, scheduled on the 19th September. So 10 days from now on, we're expecting uh, at least 50,000 people, but not sure how many are going to turn out, but it's gonna be interesting situation. And okay, I'm about to finish. <laughs> and the main demands, <laughs> the main demands uh, for the protest movement in Thailand, uh, they have the three main demands. Uh, so the first one is about uh, stop harassing people because people who, who've been uh, going out on the street, at least uh, 50 of them have been charged already. I'm also charged, but uh, my, I mean, my case is not that, uh, strong. I mean, some people are charged under sedition, so it's up to seven years in prison. Yeah, my is only up to two years. Uh, and the second demand is about uh, draft the new, drafting the new constitution. And the third demand is like uh, dissolving the parliament. But what is very, very interesting, even for me, is that uh, some young people really dare to cross the line and talking about the role of the monarchy in Thai politics openly, because I just mentioned at the beginning that we have this law, this, uh, I would call it Dragonian law that punishing people so hard, I mean, so harsh, if you dare to talk about uh, the monarchy in the way that they don't like criticizing monarchy whatsoever. But right now, more and more young people come out and then talk about the role of military and monarchy all together in public, which is, well, for me, it's something that, mm -hmm. yeah, they, I have to admire, they're so brave, 
my generation experience i mean different situation but this generation i mean they will bring uh, this country to another level so yeah that's kind of a brief situation from thailand yeah. thank you mook uh, robson would you mind um uh, sharing us a, uh, your story and and telling us a bit about the situation there in Zimbabwe. Thank you so much. I hope everyone is um, hearing me. Yes. Yes, we hear you well. We hear you well. And and I should I should say that uh, that I know that you're having trouble with the with the the connection. And so I I think we'll just listen closely. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is uh, Robson Chere. I'm the National Secretary General of Amalgamated Road Church Union of Zimbabwe. It is an organization which fights for proper education in Zimbabwe. It represents over 35,000 teachers uh, across the Zimbabwean country, and as well as the learners. Uh, apart from that, I'm also a community organizer who works uh, with uh, other civic society organizations like the Citizen Manifesto. Uh, in terms of uh, community development. I'm also a Mandela uh, Washington 2019 Fellow, uh, the Young African Leaders uh, Fellowship. Amalgamated Roadshare Union of Zimbabwe uh, uh, also fights for labor justice and proper education policies in Zimbabwe. It also advocates for uh, inclusive access to education in line with the sustainable development number, number four goal. Uh, and we believe uh, in nonviolent strategies uh, in our quest to attain some of uh, our goals. Uh, in Zimbabwe, we, we, we are at a time where we have got um, a new government that took over from the government of Robert Mugabe, uh, which was presiding over the national affairs of Zimbabwe for, from independence uh, up to 2017, where there was a military coup, and that military coup uh, brought in a, what we call a new dispensation. But uh, to us, it's a so-called new dispensation because what was being preached in the new dispensation is not what is being practiced uh, so far. And uh, it's uh, very unfortunate that the the coup was embraced by by the by the international community. But at this time, we are seeing a, a situation whereby there is a lack of respect of the rule of law. There is a clamp down in trying to thwart any uh, descending voices in Zimbabwe. But okay, to begin with on my presentation, uh, I would want to start by uh, pointing out the fact that uh, activists throughout the world are concerned with advocates and addressing challenges of uh, particular interest. And in Zimbabwe, like I said, we have a military state in place. And as a labor activist leader, we have had challenges with the, under, with the government being uh, paying uh, slave wages to, to the workers. And we have a system where the government has been shortchanging its civil servants by exploiting their labor while paying them slave wages. Uh, also, the working class, together with activists and uh, amalgamated road teachers union and organization where I belong, as the leading voice of teachers in Zimbabwe. Uh, we have been using the Zimbabwean constitution, which provides for the right to peaceful protest and picketing, that is according to section 59 of our Zimbabwean constitution. And now coming into the issue of the COVID-19, it has also brought in uh, extended limited social service delivery and worsening poverty in, in, in our country, uh, where we have already existing 80% of unemployment rate in Zimbabwe. We have seen repressive lockdown measures that have been uh, that have been put in place, where security forces have been uh, have been used not as a tool to control people movements, but to suppress any dissenting voices through the application of ruthless force. And this has further created an opportunity for the government's lutocras sector to loot intended COVID-19 resources, as has been exposed in Zimbabwe. The, the, these uh, this shenanigans of looting from the from, from, from the higher government officials and the members of the festive uh, family have been exposed by, the, by, by by prominent investigative journalists. And we have a case which you, which you call and label the Trustgate scandal, 
which implicated members of the Feste family and the high government officials. And the tattoos, we have always believed in nonviolent strategy as a powerful tool in presenting our grievance and in advancing our goals. And this we have done through different tactics over the years of our existence. In, and we have been doing this in demanding wages through protests such as the Stellar Caravan March, where our members marched, uh, were walked from a distance of 275 kilometers from one of uh, the, rural, um, the rural towns, which is Mutare, to Harare, where the headquarters of the Minister of Finance uh, offices is located, uh, to the Minister of Finance offices demanding uh, decent wages. We have also used several different non-violent strategies. At one point in time, we've used the symbolic action tactics where we did uh, pockets out protest and where we were all we were teachers encouraging them to move around with their pockets out. And uh, this gesture was being used to expose the mere fact that teachers had no money in their pockets. And this went viral to, to an extent that it, it forced the authorities to start uh, acting on this non-violent strategy that we, we were used. So basically, in coming up with a non-violent strategy of action, um, we we also have to use a lot of energy. We use a lot of energy, uh, but mainly we do this in, in the planning process and also trying up to come up with tactics that are creative. And these tactics will be also less, re less risk. And the communication that we use uh, in doing that and messaging our message will be to encourage more people uh, to participate. But as I indicated before, that the current COVID-19 lockdown in Zimbabwe is being used by authorities to crack down on dissenting voices and to shrink the civic spaces. But, but besides the fact in Zimbabwe, we recently had the most successful protest. I'm sure uh, a lot of people across the world um, who were following the Zimbabwean uh, politics and the, the Zimbabwean developments saw that there was a 31 July uh, protest, which was called by journalists pro-democracy activists, trade unions, and I'm one of the people who was also uh, being part and parcel in, in, in mobilizing for, for that nationwide protest. And that led to the state deploying the security forces uh, on the streets to the extent that on the 31st of July itself, it was only the state security agents which were in the streets and the whole country was in a shutdown. So this response by the state really pointed to the fact that the protest had an impact and the state yet to uh, resort to abduction, uh, torture, and arrest those who were perceived to be part of the protest organizing team. And as I speak right now, I have been pushed out of my bedroom. I've been pushed out of my house. I'm actually speaking uh, away from my house because the state is actually handing, uh, is still handing me uh, uh, for, for the role that I played in organizing for the 31st of July. So uh, I can say, uh, going forward, there's need to build a broader alliance from within and globally. Uh, and that will help publicize and put pressure uh, to the authorities. I understand my, the other uh, speaker before me is coming from Thailand. And you can see that some of the issues that she raised, uh, we, we share some of these, uh, these issues. But having the global alliance will help to put pressure and the things such as solidarity statements from outside will also work. And uh, like now, as I speak and about to conclude, I can say the 31st of July demonstration gave birth to a new social media campaign uh, that is uh, viral uh, on social media. And this uh, hashtag is called the Zimbabwe hashtag Zimbabwean Lives Matter, and which I urge you colleagues to also share and add your voice in condemning the current crackdown in Zimbabwe and urging the Zimbabwean authority to respect the rule of law human rights and, uh, and the democracy in Zimbabwe. Uh, I think uh, I'll end up uh, uh, now and give also some other panelists the time uh, to speak. Thank you, Robson. Thank you. Rania. Well, Thank, thank you very much for inviting me to, to speak with you. And I'm, I'm truly humbled to be speaking along with activists from, from Thailand and, and Zimbabwe. Um, I'm sure when, when you hear about Lebanon, there's lots of thoughts that actually do come to your mind. You've heard of, about the explosion that destroyed half our capital uh, a month ago. I'm sure you've heard about uh, the wars that have racked this country for decades. And so there, there's become this association about 
Lebanon with war and violence and you know possibly irrationality and so to speak. And there's another association particularly that the West loves to present about Lebanon, which is that we are a resilient population and we manage to carry on. And resiliency, I have to say, it's one of my, it's one of the words that I absolutely hate because resiliency basically means that we're able to adapt to whatever horrors uh, we face, but we are able to adapt. And I don't want us to be resilient. I want us to be transformative. I want us to be rebellious. I want us to be resistant. I'm really tired of being resilient. And I can tell you so many examples for decades how we've been resilient. One of the problems that we face, and I'm, and I'm saying this as, as an activist in Lebanon, as a political activist in Lebanon, is that the problem is not clearly understood. So either we have individuals who say that all the problems that we face in Lebanon are brought in by the outside. You know, we were a former colony, we were divided, our borders are false. We have been facing wars with, with our enemy, the Zionist state of Israel, literally since 1948, since the creation of that entity on the occupied lands of Palestine. We have this constant uh, aggression by the Israelis. We have been facing sanctions by the US government, successive US government. So, you know, it's easy for us to say it's all their fault. Um, we're also presented as a model uh, by successive US governments by So Rania, I feel you're you're uh, perhaps we can perhaps we can turn your camera off. Um, Gina, do you think that maybe you could turn Rania's camera off and see if we can regain the 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 audio feed? Um, it looks like she's almost stuck um, and frozen, Lucas, and hopefully she will get her back. I know this is one of the, the many challenges of, of talking to activists on the ground, but let's see if we can get her back on. Let's see. Uh, yeah, she's completely dropped for now. So um, maybe you could go ahead, um, Lucas, and talk a little bit about your space and what you're doing in the U.S. and what's going on, and then maybe when she comes back on, we'll let her continue. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, she's I mean, gone. We, uh, hopefully she'll reemerge. I, I, you know, I, she was in the middle of, a, I think, of a good point, <laughs> of course. That's the way, always the way it works, right? Um, you, you know, I think I think that um, um, with respect to um, the situation in the U.S., I think that, um, yeah, I, I don't know uh, where quite to begin. Uh, let me be clear that I, uh, I am not, you know, the, the difference in my um, sort of uh, uh, location and, and, and representation to the struggles is, is, is you know, I'm situated differently than the other activists that have been that's been speaking. I, I'm I'm uh, based in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, at the moment, and uh, and I've been here since the beginning of lockdown. And so I've watched uh, um, things unfold in the United States from afar and uh, tried to uh, lend my uh, support uh, from afar. Um, uh, but I can speak to. Um, you know, I just the the persistent um, reality that this is a uh, yes. Um, this is an I um okay. I I, I apologize for for that. Uh, we have electricity outages that are quite regular, and we have internet outages that are quite regular. I don't know if you all can can hear me now. Is that um, we can. again? I I apologize for our. Uh, <laughs> electricity out and our internet okay, outage. We managed to, to, to get it back. Thank you. Um, so I was saying that it is this, this presentation that we are religious communities that are coexisting that is actually the cause of, of all the crises that we have. It's the reason that we are bankrupt and we are bankrupt since October of last year. It is actually the reason why we had the explosion. What I mean by this is we have a political sectarian system in Lebanon. A political sectarian system means we do not vote one person, one vote in Lebanon. I, do, I cannot get elected based on my capabilities. I cannot get elected based on my platform. I get elected based upon the size 
of the confession into which I was born. And we're all born into particular sectarian communities. So depending on the size of the sect into which you are born, every single position in public office gets dictated consequently. So whether I can be president or speaker of the house or a member of parliament or a general manager in the ministry or even a professor in our public university, on and on and on, all those are dictated by the size of the sect into which I was born. And this is the model the French gave us and this is the model that US governments love. And it is the very definition of the destruction of a democracy and it is the very way to divide a national community together. And it, by definition, by design, forces politicians to be corrupt, forces them to breed clientelism, and eventually leads us to the state where no politicians actually representing the country, rather they are all representing these artificial communities called sects, and they're all by design held hostage to foreign countries and foreign interests. So leading us to this state that we have now, where we have 50% unemployment in Lebanon, we have lost since 1992, 50% of the generations between 20 and 50 have emigrated from the country, 50%. And it has increased to six folds just these past two years with everybody just dreaming about leaving. It, Lebanon has become a sinking ship. And we've seen it truly in the explosion that hit our port, where you know we lost, more than 30% of her capital with an explosion that was fully the cause of criminal political negligence, fully, you know. So amidst all of that, what can we do as activists? Yes, there has been a very large protest movement that erupted in October. Um, yes, the, the level of state repression against us has been quite intense, nowhere near as intense, let me make it clear, nowhere near as intense as police brutality against black and indigenous communities in the United States but nevertheless very intense compared to what we are used to by our military and our police. Um, what I have learned very briefly in Lebanon as a political activist and what I have learned as an activist is um, activism can only take us so far. What is absolutely needed is political organizing, to organize within a political party, because it is within political parties that we're able to think about transformative issues, rather than how do we deal with our waste management, how do we get electricity, how do I deal with the, the derision of our freedom of speech, so on and so forth. Rather, we're thinking about but an entirely new political system and how do we build political alliances and how do we do that work and I can speak about that and about uh, my own lessons through that and as well I can speak if you're interested you know in the Q&A about the many different movements we've had in the country um, during the civil war from 1975 to 1991 how people managed to protest for nonviolence in the midst of the civil war and how they were treated and since 1992 onwards how the sectarian political system worked to co-opt labor movements, work to co-opt women's rights movement, work to co-opt so many different movements, either to co-opt them or to oppress them through fear or to threaten us with our livelihoods. You know, and how over the past four to five years, we've seen a resurgence of political parties, a reawakening of the old traditional political parties. The oldest political party in Lebanon, by the way, is the Communist Party. It is the first political party in Lebanon. And, you know, I'm, I have to say, even though I'm not a communist, I'm very proud about that being our oldest political party. So I could speak about that if you're interested. But I just want to say that, and I think this applies to Zimbabwe, I think it applies to Thailand, I think it applies around the world, that there are no easy answers. There, there is no easy pathway, I can say, that I have learned if we do X, Y, and Z, we can get our liberty and we can get our transformation, we can get our political dignity. There are no easy answers. It is extremely difficult. Even now, even though we have a vision, we have a political vision, we have a political strategy, some of the most difficult moments I have had have not been in dealing with those who I oppose politically, but have actually been in trying to build negotiations with those who should be our political allies. Those have been the most difficult conversations, not with those who step across from me on the other side of the table with whom I speak about nonviolence and, and forgiveness and, and brotherhood, but actually those that I'm trying to, to, to build up. And one last thing I, I must say is, as somebody who speaks as a member of an occupied and oppressed population, and I say occupied because I consider Palestine also to be mine, and oppressed because we in this region have been oppressed. I think particularly our first challenge is how do we liberate our minds? How do we liberate our hearts? How do we start to believe truly that 
another country is possible, another way of life is possible, another economic system is possible. I think that is our first challenge because too many of us in Lebanon, I can say, and I, and I think this applies universally, too many of us who have been downtrodden for generations, not simply for decades, but for generations, have lost the courage to actually imagine something else. And we have accepted what the oppressor tells us to just take a bit of crumbs and just accept a little bit of crumbs. And so our first challenge becomes, no, I refuse to accept crumbs. I firmly believe that I'm willing to struggle in this marathon for liberation, it's not a sprint. And if it doesn't happen in my lifetime, I consider it a privilege that I would be part of that struggle. But to me, it starts here with the liberty of, of the self. Um, and I apologize again for the electricity outage that we're facing in Lebanon on an increasing level. And I look forward to all your questions and comments and how we may build a, a solidarity that is really led by the people themselves. Thank you, Rania. Thank you so much. Um, I, so I want to I, I wanna begin by um, asking, um, you know, I, I feel like um, there were a number of things, a number of moments where when each of you um, referenced uh, something that you had heard in the other, in the other context, um, uh, whether that was, you know, Rania, you referencing what you heard in, uh, in Zimbabwe or Robson, you heard referencing something familiar in Thailand. And I'm, I'm wondering if that um, uh, stir, if, if hearing the other descriptions of, of, of context of struggle um, stirred in you questions that you would have of each other. Uh, right over to, uh, to the, 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 the whole group. Um, Okay. So, so if that if ever something does come to you, um, but Can I um, come in? yes, Robson. Okay, I want to ask you from uh, my other two colleagues who were also part of the panelists. Like, in our situation, we are dealing in a situation. We have a situation whereby we have political, deep political polarization in our country. The country is divided on uh, on political, well, political. I think um, political banners. Whether one is for the ruling party or the, uh, from the opposition, there are two extreme. Uh, there's two extreme political polarization. So I wanted to uh, ask you from 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 their own experience and from uh, the countries that they are in. Uh, how 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 uh, how do they uh, counter such a scenario? Uh, if there is such scenario in the, in, the, in their country, thank you. To 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 be sure that I understand your question, Robson. So you're asking, how do they counter the extreme polarization when 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 the politics are 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 sort of put within this in the part, partisan framework between between political parties? Yes, I, yes, definitely. As activists, how do they deal with such a situation, especially when it comes to delivering a message which resonates with the masses? And in a situation where there's deep political polarization. Right. So it, it limits um, the framing of the message. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if you want, I, I can speak to that because we have extraordinary polarizations in this country where we have individuals that have been protesting and believe very much that France can lead us toward a new political system or that the United States can lead us toward a new political system. We have individuals that consider that we need to have a surrender treaty uh, with Israel. Um, and, and so we've got that polarization. For me, what I think is vital, absolutely essential, and I say this as a political activist, is that there needs to be clarity in the message. So I don't mind the polarization as much as I mind when the politics is not clear because then it harms me. So if, if I am sharing a stage, if I'm, if I'm in a protest with an individual next to me whose banner might not be well understood, then it would reflect badly on me. And I would much rather his banner to be clear, let him be clear in what he wants so that I can then make my decision if I want to stand beside him or if I want to stand on another stage. But when his banner is not clear and, and it's deliberately not clear, 
then he is able to use my political party as supportive of his political position. And here is where we have the problems. So in our protest movement in Lebanon, we have been accused of being agents of embassies. Uh, we have been accused of being traitors. Um, you know, we have been accused of, of everything under the sun. Of course, I'm, I'm not an agent of, of any embassy. And, and what I need then is for everybody to be clear. Nobody is going to say they're an agent of an embassy. But if they have the courage to say what they want clearly, then I am able to have a conversation with them. Um, so to me, the, the, the main harm that we have is when, with a lack of political clarity. Once that political clarity is courageously presented, then I may have a conversation those that do be the friend that the French government can lead us toward liberty, I can remind them not only that the French sought to execute my own grandfather because he fought against the French occupation at Lebanon, but I can remind them um, about what it means when liberty is brought from outside instead of liberty coming from inside. And we can have a conversation, but for that conversation to have had, it needs to first have the, the clarity of political courage, you know. Um, another complication that arises in Lebanon, which I'm sure this is present universally, is that every single one of our media outlets has a political perspective. Uh, fortunately, our media outlets in Lebanon are more politically aware of their political perspective than consumers of media in the United States may be, because people in the US may think that there is a world of difference between Fox and MSNBC and CNN, for example. In Lebanon, we know very much every political, every, every news channel is led by a particular politician. So consequently, we're aware of that political part partisanship, but at the same time, those TV channels remain the primary source of information for people on the ground. So then for us as protesters, what happens when one of those TV channels adopts our protest movement? So here then becomes another layer of, of political uh, problematics that, that we have to see what we do with, you know. Um, so we're, we're living that that polarization and, and that binary presentation, which in and of itself can be destructive. For me, I, it, I think clarity becomes the way forward, clarity and courage. Thank you, Rania. Thank you, Robson. Um, Mo, did you want to did you want to add anything or, or ask any questions before I open it up? Uh, just to uh, answer uh, Robson's uh, question, like, I mean, because the situation in Thailand, I mean, is, is quite a bit, uh, let's say, unique. It's not really about uh, the fight between political fractions and other stuff, but right now it's more like uh, between, let's say, the young generation, uh, younger generation, uh, who's more, how to say, who's more exposed to different ideas and other stuff and they become pretty much critical to uh, any kind of uh, ex existing institutions, including the monarchy and military, while uh, the older generation, they still, let's say, stuck with uh, the nice or the good storytelling about the role of the king and the monarchy, what, uh, what have they done good to Thailand, to this country. So, it's actually very unique, I would say unique uh, context compared to, well, I mean, even with other countries that still have a constitutional monarchy system. Yeah, so, no, nah, it's, not, it's not really easy. Like right now, the protest movement has been accused of being uh, traitors, being accused of uh, getting intervened by, or being intervened by uh, international actors, uh, by, of course, uh, this guy, his name has been here and there for a long time, he has been influenced by uh, Joss Ross, for example, or has been influenced by uh, US or uh, European countries and all that stuff. But, well, I mean, for this kind of polarization. Uh, yeah, I mean, time will tell basically. We cannot win things, uh, we cannot win zero sum game in the current situation because uh, the older generation still holds some kind of uh, power in different institutions. And the younger generation wants uh, 
completely. I mean, want to change things completely. So it's like, uh, I mean, I have to refer to Gramsci. He said like when, when uh, the old thing is not yet dying and the new things cannot yet be born. So this is time of uh, cruelty and it's the time of uh, some kind of uh, very weird stuff. And this is what we're experiencing right now in Thailand. But I would say 10 years from now on, the situation would be 10 to 15 years from now on, the situation would be totally different in, in this country. So yeah, let's hope. Mm, thank you. So let me uh, open it up to, uh, to uh, the, the rest of, of the community here gathered. So who, are, are, there, are there other questions? Vedran, please. Hello, everyone, and really thank you for all three presentations. Uh, it was really uh, interesting, and um, and I have a question which I, I would uh, um, I would ask in Siri, but I think it is basically the same question for all of for all of you. So. Um, as uh, as Catherine told in the beginning, uh, we were uh, Rotary Peace Fellows in Thailand. And uh, when we were in Thailand, we were immediately told uh, not to ask anything about the king, the military, the monks. Uh, and my uh, my analytical mind uh, immediately invoked the memories that, uh, that we have here in, in Croatia from communist times. Um, and also, I would say also, which I personally saw when I lived in Iran for two years, and that is how to tackle uh, the oppressive rule without directly exposing oneself to arrests and destroying uh, of a movement. Uh, so in, in other words, how to have a sustainable movement, which is constantly critical against the government, but without possibility to be charged for crimes. So in that context, uh, uh, and and today con in the contemporary Thailand, uh, can you can you explain more what is the role of of culture, of arts, of uh, I don't know musicians or or even teachers and progressive clergy uh, etc. Um, and tied to that, what is the capacity of these new generations and their 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 shifts in a manner of open protest that can lead uh, uh, to charges? Because if you have a lot of people who are um, uh, directly talking against the king. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure, is, is there a capacity for a lot of people who can do that? Or, or are there uh, other ways how to be constantly critical against the government? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's actually very interesting question because uh, we have even uh, musicians who've been charged already. We have uh, rappers who've been charged already. We have, uh, what else? We have uh, union leaders who've been charged, who has been charged already just by uh, involving in the protest movement, including a human rights lawyer who, were, uh, who was an, another activist who was just released yesterday. So, I mean, alongside the students, of course, uh, well, because uh, talking about the king and the prohibition, I mean, to mention them in public is very culturally embedded in Thailand. I mean, I would say even if there's no law, people would say, yeah, I want to stay away from this topic because, uh, because they feel like uh, they owe something to the monarchy, like uh, this is kind of the main narrative of uh, Thai history that uh, the monarchy saved this country, has saved this country for yeah, 400 years and all that stuff. So it's very culturally embedded. So yeah, to a certain extent, I have to uh, give the credit to another Thai in exile. He is now lives in Japan. He is a political science professor. Uh, he opens he up the group uh, on Facebook called the Royalist Marketplace. 
and right now it has more than 1.2 million members on this facebook group and of course i mean there are different kind of uh, stuff on that facebook group not always uh, academic related stuff but it's also something about uh well do you know tiktok application right the chinese one that you mock people you dance you do some crazy stuff there so this uh this professor his name is pawin shasawan pongpan he actually used those kind of platform to let's say mock or even expose uh or how to say to address the issues about the role of uh monarchy in in Thai politics i mean it's actually quite smart way and i mean it's not like everyone can do it of course because most academicians they tend to go uh just in specific way right talking about uh political science and other stuff but uh this this uh this professor for when he used uh tiktok he used uh Britney Spears song, he used uh, that kind of stuff to actually, I mean, talk about the role of monarchy in Thai politics in a funny way. But for people who live in the country, uh, if you get involved with the protest movement one way or another, uh, well, it's almost inevitable. Even the rapper was charged, even the musicians were, who, who just played the music, I mean, in the protest were charged. So, yeah, it's about uh, to be able to sustain the whole movement without getting exhausted, without getting burned out before we achieve what we want. So, right, yeah, I mean, it's been three months and it's very tiring, it's very exhausting. So we may have to discuss uh, or talk about alternative uh, ways to keep the protest alive and people who get involved are not gonna well i mean are not gonna get so exhausted anytime soon so yeah that's that's actually a good question and we 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 we're thinking that we should talk about it yeah before everyone gets super burned out it's been three months of street protests flash mobs everywhere well it's tiring so we have to think about it. like how we continue and sustain the movement. Thank you, Mook. Uh, Robson, you wanted to comment on, on, on this as well? Yeah, let me just um, address or support the point of the last speaker. But uh, it, it, it differs with the context, but um, also in terms of the approach that we have also when there's a higher risk, the um, first of all, we have to create um, or to be creative in terms of the activity that we want to carry on, which will be less risk and the messaging uh, part of it. But in a system uh, that is too ruthless, like um, uh, the one that has been uh, said to be in place, we can also target the pillars of power that support that system and package our message in a way that will, uh, that will make those pillars of uh, power be on our side. Okay, we are talking from two different contexts, but I think this also apply um, depending on how uh, it has been uh, it has been actually packaged. For example, at Amalgamated Road Church Union of Zimbabwe, we have been at the receiving end uh, uh, being uh, arrested for demanding uh, better salaries for civil servants. But the people who will be arresting us are the police officers. They are part of the civil servants as well, but due to their nature of work, they are not allowed to 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 they are not allowed to 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 protest. So the kind of the message that we ended up having is that when we will be striking, we will be striking with the or protesting with the placards written, "Pay our police officers, they deserve better salaries, they deserve uh, decent uh, decent wages." To an extent that he, he, it will resonate well with, uh, with, with, with what they will be willing or what they will be wanting. And at one point in time, there was a, there was a moment when thousands of them were deployed uh, to arrest us. And they, 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 they totally refused to arrest us because we were speaking the language that were resonating with, with, with their demands as well, though they were not in a situation to be able to, to, to protest. So sometimes it is also uh, targeting those pillars of power and coming up with a messaging that will also resonate with well so that we can turn the opponents into becoming our allies. Thank you. 
Thank you, Robson. Rania, you wanted to comment on this? Um, yes, just, just briefly. Uh, Vedron, you posed the question, how can we have a, a sustainable movement without exposure to um, you know, laws being imposed against us? In my perspective, once we are powerful, once we are effective, they will change the laws to target us. So the question for me isn't, how do we evade um, you know, going to jail? Rather, it is how to build a sustainable movement that will protect our protesters once they are arrested. Because, you know, I, I, I think it would be a natural aspect and many of us have gotten arrested just over the past year. And what we've been able to do is we've built a wonderful relationship with lawyers. And so, and, and lawyers both in the sense of lawyers that will work pro bono to get our comrades out of detention and then we'll be able to help them if they are tried. But in, in Lebanon, we're first thrown into detention before trial. And this becomes a pivoting point for our organizing just to get them out of detention. So here we have a slew of lawyers that work pro bono. We're also able to work with more high profile lawyers. The mere fact that we can get the head of the lawyer syndicate to come to um, the police station is political pressure in and of itself. So how do we then apply political pressure on the the police to release our comrades becomes one way. The other way uh, that we're able to do that through lawyers, the other way to do that is through alternative media. So we are allowed on Twitter and Facebook and WhatsApp groups, et cetera, et cetera. And we're able to move from one protest center to the next. So if we are protesting in one square and they take our comrades, many of us then just move our protest to the police station. And we're staying there overnight all the time until they release our comrades. So we make it clear to them that we're not letting go of anyone just because you know we said we're protesting here. You take our comrades, we will follow our comrades. And so it, it creates a political problem then because now we're weaker because we're in two places, but at the same time for us to be sustainable means we have to take care of our own. And so we, we've been managing to do that. The problem becomes when low income comrades get detained and they're not well known. And, and this happens a lot. So when they're young boys, you know, 12, 14, 15, and we don't know their names and they are participating in protest because they just came out of a ghetto. Uh, you know, they're, they're not well known by the political parties. They're not well known by the comrades. We may not know when they get detained. So how would we know then to, to run and protect them? And this becomes a big problem for us. Even though those are the ones that are protecting us as women and protecting many others literally with their young bodies. But so we need to build relationships to understand who are all the people and how can we protect all, all our comrades, even if we, we don't know them. So, you know, we're, we're learning through that. Uh, but that becomes one thing that, that, that we have been able to do. And I would say quite successfully, we've been able to get most of our comrades out of detention so they don't even face trial. So I just want to to remind everyone that if um, if you do want to ask a question, please, you know, uh, if you're in the Zoom meeting, uh, uh, then please indicate so that you, in the in the chat you um, are on Facebook Live. Uh, also, um, let it be known that you have a question to 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 uh, to ask. Uh, Ian, you wanted to uh, you had a question. Ian Hollingworth. Well, that, I, I don't actually have a question. I, I, I messaged uh, uh, Rania with a question about this, the, um, the sex that she mentioned earlier. Um, and I just, I don't know whether it's appropriate to elaborate on that now, if we've got time, but it was a, something I'd never heard of and uh, I wanted to follow it up. So I've asked for some reading material. Okay. Uh, Rania, if you, want, if you want to give a cliff notes version. Yes, I mean, if, if anyone is interested in reading material on our political system, please let me know, because the problem is the West grossly misrepresents it as a coexistence of communities, which is false. I'll, I'll just give you a simple example. My family name, we have all the religious communities within my family name. It, it you know, we convert out of faith or we convert for marriage or we convert for politics. It doesn't mean anything. So we've always lived as Muslim, Christian and Jews in this region, and it's been natural. That is the story of this land. Um, but the, what, what I mean is when, when foreigners come and they colonize and then they come up with a political system that seeks to divide us. And so then rather than seeing us as Lebanese or rather seeing us as Syrians or Palestinians or whatever, they came up with this idea, oh, we're going to see you as Muslims and Christians and Druze. 
And then we're going to break it down even further and see you as Maronites, Greek Orthodox, Sunni, Shia, Druze, Alawites, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and come up with 18 different religious communities. And oh my God, look at all your diversity and how you're managing to live together. Like, this is hogwash. We've always been here for centuries. I mean, what are you talking about? And then they say, oh, but you know, this community is so small. And for us to protect this community, we'll give you these, these positions in, in, in parliament. And, and we're going, but we never thought of ourselves that way, but you give us a few generations. And now it becomes, you know, I, I can't run for a municipal office in the city in which I live because the community into which I was born is not large enough in the municipality into which I was registered. And you're like, what, what is this? <laughs> it's like pure hogwash. And again, the fact that this political system was brought by the French who argue liberty, equality, and fraternity and separation of religion from government, but they have wedded our religious identity to our government, I think speaks volumes about what colonizers really want to do when they leave the colonized communities. They specifically want to leave us with a system that will divide us so that they can have a greater sense of influencing us. And let us please remember, this is the same system that the United States has been trying to enforce on Iraq, the same system the United States want to enforce on Libya, the same system the United States want to enforce on Syria, you know, it's the same system that propagates the apartheid system in Palestine, which is, oh my God, we've never lived together. We've always lived together. That has never been the problem. But by looking at us as members of the way we choose to worship God, it creates division, it breeds corruption, and it encourages civil violence. So here we are trying to transform that entire system um, so that we can actually have direct representation between us and our politicians, you know, which again, for the United States, for Western Europe, this sounds absurd because that is how those countries have built their own democracies, but it is not how those countries have encouraged our political systems in this region. So thank you, Rania. I, I have a question also for you from Susan Smith uh, asking on Facebook. Um, it's a question regarding uh, Sir the Syrian liberation struggle. How do you respond to well-meaning peace activists who, in in an effort to prevent another government overthrow by the West, i.e., for example, as we have seen in Iraq and Libya, support the Assad regime to the extent that they adopt the Syrian government's denial that it conducted chemical weapons attacks against civilians, who the regime labels as Muslim extremists, thereby creating a false binary of the Assad regime versus the terrorists. I, I, yeah, I, d I don't know if, if you have um, thoughts about that. I know that's not your context. I, I can briefly speak about this because, no, it actually is my context as well, because there's no way that we can um, have a strong state in Lebanon with Syria being broken as it has been broken for decades, and particularly with a war that's been imposed on Syria for more than 11 years. So yes, it, it is necessary. And it reminds me very much of the, the narrative, the binary narrative that folks in the US used to speak of when I was organizing against the sanctions on Iraq. And they say, oh, if you speak against the sanctions on Iraq, then you're supporting Saddam Hussein. So it, it's a very problematic binary. Yes, the Syrian government um, has created a political environment in Syria and an economic, particularly Bashar al-Assad more so than his father, has created an economic system that has encouraged um, economic violence. This is how I define poverty. I think let's, let's call poverty what it is, which is an act of economic violence. And so this is what that Syrian government has done. It has created a political environment of repression, most definitely, and it has created extremely problematic economic conditions, okay? There has been, for a long time, a nonviolent national movement in Syria for a transformative governmental system. That very much has, has been in place for decades, and it was also in place at the beginning of uh, the protest movement in Syria. However, at the same time, there was another community uh, of individuals, some of whom are Syrian, some of whom were not Syrian, some of whom came all the way from Afghanistan and Tunisia and the United Kingdom and so forth, okay, that bred the so-called Islamic philosophy of Saudi Arabia, which in my reading has nothing to do with Islam, okay, funded a great deal by Qatar and the United States and actually led terroristic campaigns against communities in Syria. So we had state violence on one hand, we had armed violence on the other, and you had a non-violence movement that was completely er eradicated and has been dismissed and is barely present, okay? Amidst this, yes, where do people stand on the outside? What kind of solidarity can they present? And to me, and I, and I say this, and 
I'm not sure how well liked it will be, but sanctions are an act of violence. Sanctions that, that particularly the sanctions that, um, you know, the, the US government has been wedded to for decades and sanctions that have been propelled primarily by the Obama regime, before him by the Clinton regime, are an act of violence. There is no way we can be supporting sanctions such as the US Caesar Act right now by the Trump regime against Syrians in the belief that if we, you know, put economic pressure on certain Syrian institutions that it will not have impact on the Syrian population, that is a fallacy. There's no way. So if we do want to support a transformative nonviolent movement in Syria, it begins by supporting the people through economic support, by understanding that the things are not binary, they're, they're not black and white, that politics is gray, but politics must always, always, if it is to be noble, must never regard communities as collateral damage in further political exploits. So as much as I oppose the Syrian government, as much as I wish we had a different Syrian government in, in Syria, in no way can I ever sacrifice pain being imposed on the Syrian population with the possibility that this pain can also reach the Syrian government. One, I find that the United States has no moral ground to be even doing that, no political ground to be doing that. And furthermore, it is completely devastating to the Syrian population, devastating to us in Lebanon, by the way, because sanctions have a very large impact on us economically. So that to me means solidarity. How do we start by supporting the people? Um, you know, which, how do we start by supporting nonviolence? And there cannot be, there cannot be a movement that comes from the people that uses violence against an army, whether or not it is justified, in my opinion, is irrelevant. It can never be strategic. The army is always more military equipped than the people. So why am I poking that bear? Unless, you know, I don't care. So I can never support a population using um, military violence against an army, not just ethically, but strategically. Add on to that when that military is composed of conscripted men who primarily are the working poor in the country, I can never support violence against the poor. So the, again, to complicate it, it's, it's, not this, this not, it's not this black and white situation, you know, so um, that, that, that becomes my perspective. The best thing that folks in the West can do for people in this region, in all honesty, is to leave us alone. <laughs> I mean, in terms of governments, just really. Uh, and maybe then that could be one step forward from the governments, not the people, but for the governments. Thank you, Rania. And thank you, Susan. Um, so, Catherine, would you like to ask your question? Um, yes, I can do so. Um, and I think also Penn Garver um, was also interested in the answer. Um, so I just have a question about the importance of training, education, awareness building within the community where you're working to mobilize people. Um, how much do you think, how much do you prioritize it for your campaigns and movements um, and long-term mobilization? And how do you actually implement it? You know, do you have training schools on the ground? Uh, do you have online sessions? Um, do you do train the trainer sessions? Just how do you actually work on that and implement. I know many of you are, are also educators and trainers, so um, I'd love to hear your answers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, can I come in now? Great. Yes. And Robson, do you mind just turning on your video for one second? I'd love for them to be able to see you. Uh, if it's not too dark, and then you could turn it off because I know there's an issue with the bandwidth. But if you don't have the ability, that's what you do. I'm having challenges with the electricity. Yeah, you can just wait so off. we can see you. That's great. That's enough if you want. That's fine. Thanks. <laughs> can you see me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you see me? Yeah. Now it's switched off now. It's switching on and off. It's uh, electricity. No, you can turn it off, off now. I, so, I, 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 yeah, it's good to see you. Uh, uh, all right. Thank you. Now, I want to speak about the importance uh, of, uh, of uh, training, education, as well as um, now on that issue, it remains our number one priority, uh, the training and education part of it. Is, it remains our number one priority because it, 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 it enhances a shared common vision among, uh, among our comrades, among the general citizenry, and it also empowers, uh, it also empowers the, the citizens uh, in terms of uh, their capacity, you know, uh, when you're talking about even at community level, uh, 
the the reason why we do have challenges in communities that the com some of the the communities are not empowered enough they do they lack the information the, that they have power over some other jurisdictions for example talk about social auditing at community level uh, they some some citizens might think because of lack of knowledge that uh, they might think that they do not have the power to question those who are in authority yet they do have the power they think that the, their rights are prescribed by other people yet these are written, uh, the, these rights uh, they are there and they are, they must they must be actually respected so when we are training uh, training in place it will put us on the same pathway and we are talking and we are sharing the same ideology so training is, is of paramount importance uh, so at Amoga Method Road Church Union of Zimbabwe, uh, we, we, care, we do our trainings, but mainly because of lack of resources. We do some of them uh, online where we can um, bring in some, we bring in some people who can facilitate the training part of it. And also we can do some small gathering in, in, in the community level where we can, train, uh, we can train our comrades and also the general citizenry. But the education component of it, we, we should not undermine it. It has played a very critical role, and it is the one that, is, that has been working as a pillar of, uh, of strengthening the power or empowering a general citizen to actually demand what is rightfully his or hers, to demand what is rightfully ours. So training is of paramount importance. It's unfortunate that at times, uh, we operate with limited resources, but I, I would put uh, training as a, the first and the paramount importance priority. Thank you, Robson. Did anyone else want to speak on the, any of the other panelists want to speak on um, the question of training? I mean, in brief, we don't really do training. Uh, in Lebanon, we have the highest per capita of NGOs in the world. And um, it's a deeply problematic, actually, layer that we have in Lebanon. But what we are doing very much is, is we're offering, so we have a YouTube page, you all can check it out, M-M-F-I-D-A-W-L-A, -A, in, in which we, we offer information. So it's not really training, it's analysis. So why do we have electricity outages in Lebanon, for example? Why is our internet the most expensive in the world, et cetera, et cetera? So just to, to have people understand the relationship between our infrastructure and our political system. So it's not quite training. Um, it's more, uh, you know, political infomercials, if we could be so, uh, you know, crass. <laughs> so, um, Mook, and just to let everyone know, I want to acknowledge we're, we're, we're going to be going over just a little bit, but we'll still try to wrap uh, in about five minutes. Um, Mook, would you like to, to add? Yeah, I mean, if you ask me, Robeson. actually. <laughs> Mike is yeah. on, Robson. Just to, sorry, go ahead, Mook. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, I actually believe that protest movement can emerge uh, spontaneously. But what would make them successful is actually planning, and we are working on it. Uh, yeah, as Ian already mentioned in the chat box, that uh, some students are translating classic works on uh, novel and resistant, like Jean Charles stuff, and also uh, like a beautiful travel tools box and all that stuff. So yeah, we're working on that front, and yeah, I mean. That is, uh, that is emerging, but uh, that is something is new and is happening here in Thailand. But well, for the details, like who are doing what and who are working with whom, I mean, I, I prefer to, to just keep it at the moment. Yeah, because I mean, this is public seminar. So uh, of course the Intel's officers and all that stuff, I mean, some of them of course understand English so they can listen to this. And if I give out all the details, it's not going to be that good for, for the movement's planning. Yeah, but we, we're working on that front. Thank you. Well, 
I just want to express my gratitude to everyone for being here and everyone for being on this uh, uh, on this call, and my gratitude to the panelists for for taking the time to, you know, as I said earlier, to really share, uh, you know, from their from their experiences and uh, and 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 from their courage and the courage of their of their work. And um, I think I'd like to close um, with one question of my own, and that is just a question about self care. Um, uh, I'm wondering, uh, you know, what are the things that, that, that you're doing to, to, to what, what advice would you give and what are the ways that you're trying to model self-care in the context of your movement? Um, I'm, I'm going to go first just because I have a, a political meeting that, that I'm late to, so my apologies, but um, I, I don't think we're, we're taking care of ourselves. I'll just be very blunt about it. Uh, there, there's a huge sense of despair. Um, it, it is extremely difficult. Many of us, since the explosion last month, we've, we've lost our taste. Um, we've lost a sense of joy. We may feel that actually when we are smiling that we feel guilty for smiling. Um, and the fact that this has happened in the midst of COVID means that we can't have physical intimacy to, to get us through it, uh, which, which makes it more difficult. So, uh, you know, I feel broken, but I can't go to my girlfriend and get a hug. I can't go to my, my comrade and get support because there's COVID. Um, and and there, there, there's a huge sense of survivor's guilt. Uh, I feel it. I'm sure people in the country feel it. You know, why we, we lost 200 people in an explosion and nothing's changed. Um, so there is a huge, huge sense of despair. Uh, what gets me through it is um, both positive and negative, knowing that this, as urgent as it is, that change can't come tomorrow. So as painful as that is for me to say that it won't come tomorrow, maybe if my body starts to hear it enough, then I will be a little bit kinder to myself and I will be able to say, okay, if change can't come tomorrow, how can I maintain myself so that I can be in the struggle for longer? Because there's no option, none of us can leave the struggle. Leaving the struggle to me is emotional suicide. If, if, I, stop, uh, if I stop being part of a struggle for change, it, I would be alive, but I would be dead. So how do we maintain uh, ourselves? Uh, and I, I wish there was an easy answer. People talk about exercise, but you know, I, I didn't do that when I was happy. <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna exercise when I'm sad. <laughs> Right. How you know all of us that go through difficulty are able to um, maintain ourselves, and you know it would be great to to hear about it. I, I hear about the the difficulty from Comrade Robinson in, in in Zimbabwe, and and I feel both saddened that somebody is going through such difficulty where you can't even be in your own home, and at the same time immensely humbled that we have these struggles that are happening universally and and they're ongoing. Um, if I may say just one thing, uh, perhaps the. I recently learned that the U.S. Supreme Court returned a very large portion of Eastern Oklahoma back to the First Nation community from Oklahoma, which is the CO tribe. And, you know, so what do I have to do with First Nation communities in Oklahoma? The fact that we're talking about a centuries long struggle and some rights, some rights, not all, were able to be returned to the indigenous communities in, in what is now Western Oklahoma, to me, gives me strength. Hopefully the liberation can happen sooner than several centuries down the road, but you know, I get great strength from the First Nation uh, communities, uh, be it in the United States or in Australia or elsewhere. So just want to end on that positive note and kudos to the, uh, all the communities that are struggling. And again, thank you all for your time and my apologies that, that I, I have to leave. Uh, thank you to Waging Nonviolence for, for organizing this and to you all for your time uh, and support. Thank you, Rania. Thank you, and coming to your question. Uh, Robson, it's hard. It's hard for us to hear you. 
You're not coming in clearly. Is there a way that you can position yourself differently, perhaps with the signal? So, Robson, we still we still don't hear you. So, uh, perhaps you can you could. Maybe you could send a a a a, a note in the chat about um uh, about your response to that question. Um, Mook, would you would you do you have anything to to share about how you how you're sustaining yourselves and yourself in the midst of this? Yeah, I mean it's something quite new to to us activists here in Thailand as well. But I mean it's good that. Uh, at least we started talking about among, I mean, people in our movement, like uh, psychological uh, well-being is also part of the whole security stuff. Uh, I mean, aside physical security as well as digital security, we also discuss uh, psychological well-being. So, yeah, we're trying to support each other as much as we can and I would say one one good thing about Thai people or Thai activists maybe or even Thai internet users is that we can make fun of pretty much everything. I mean, even in a very serious situation, you can ask uh, Catherine, she's been here to Thailand. We make fun of uh, pretty much every situation. I mean, it's is a good thing and well yeah i mean sometimes people think like we don't take things that seriously but it's our way to cope with uh reality i mean if you look at the humors of uh, twitter users the young generation from thailand i mean they're really the best their memes is i mean their memes are like really really something really i mean i mean they are on different levels so yeah so so both we make fun of stuff, we support each other and yeah, and yeah, we tell each other to take a rest. I mean I mean if it's needed. I mean it's part of uh it's part of how to maintain or make the the movement sustainable. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um I want to uh Thank uh, Solidarity 2020 and uh, and Waging Nonviolence for this uh, for for making this happen and for bringing us all together to be in conversation. I want to um, give everyone a, a give a little plug here about the the next uh, uh, conversation that's going to take place. The Taupin Corruption Nexus and. Um, the description uh, of the next conversation is corruption is hampering responses to COVID-19 and responses to the pandemic are increasing, are increasing corruption risks. Caught in the middle are people whose lives, livelihoods, and futures are jeopardized. What happens when they mobilize to tackle the COVID corruption nexus? How, how are they wielding power and what are their objectives? What can we learn from our own context? Join this teach-in for a learning exchange for for creative anti-corruption activists on the front lines, um, so that's a that's a, uh, the next conversation that's that's going to be be convened. And Catherine, when is that happening? That is happening next Wednesday, September sixteenth, at ten a.m. So an hour earlier Eastern Standard Time, and then okay. uh, sorted times around the world. Okay. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone. Robson, are, are you, can, do we want to try your mic one more time? Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Do you want to, do you want to close us out with some thoughts? Oh, sure. So I was just saying in terms of um, uh, taking care of um, myself uh, at such a time as this, it's a very difficult question, but the question I always ask myself is that if it's not me, then who? If it's not now, then when? And that will give me the answer that it's us and it's now. And that is the spirit that will keep me um, 
moving uh, on going forward because uh, at the end of the day it is about my conscience it's about the beliefs and it is about also this year to um, see a, a nation where we enjoy the fruits of the of freedom where we we enjoy the fruits of democracy and where we enjoy the fruits of being um, where human rights are being respected uh, i thank you thank you thank you and thank you all and uh stay strong and and uh until until next time sure thank you for having me also on the program we hope to see each other next time goodbye everyone and mute and say goodbye bye Catherine. Bye. Bye. i hope my i hope my video i hope my <laughs> video is that's great